O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, you who set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and infants you've ordained strength because of your enemies, that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you visit him? For you've made him but a little lower than the angels, and you've crowned him with glory and honor. You've made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You've put all things under his feet. All sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, and all that passes through the paths of the seas. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. We praise our God. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Let's go to our Father in prayer. Loving Father and Almighty God, we recognize that you're the all-powerful creator of this universe that we live in, and we just praise your name. Uh, you are the mo most majestic be being in all the universe. Your intellect is obvious to us. Um, just looking around us and seeing the beauty of the creation we can see the power and the wisdom that was necessary to design it and to create it. Not only that, Father, you are gracious to us. You are our refuge. You are the one that we lean on. You're our strength and you're our protector, our shield. Father, we just are amazed at your power, your intellect, and your grace that you show us. We know that this earth is just a shadow of what you have in store for us in heaven too. And so that um, just makes us um, look forward to that day even more when we can be with you there. Father, we are thankful that you hear our prayers and answer our prayers and that shows that you are indeed a loving God and you watch over us and you care for us. You're concerned about us. You've provided a way for uh, deliverance for us and a provision for our salvation. You watch over us and care for us and give us really more than we need. And seeing all of that, we know that you love us just through the blessings that you provide. Most of all, Father, we're thankful for the path that you provided for our salvation through your son, Jesus Christ. And we're thankful that we know how we should live our lives. We know that because you've given us the word as a, a guide so that we can know the best way to spend our time here on earth, to let our lights shine, to be an influence for good, and to do all of that while trying to uh, place the glory in you. Thank you, Father, for this church and its leadership, um, for their watchful care over us as well. Uh, just be with our elders, our deacons, our preachers, our teachers, and each of us as members, that we can be there for each other and help each other to um, endure life here and succeed here in our striving to um, be a influence for good and an influence on others to be drawn to you. We ask, Father, that you would um, help us to overcome any obstacles that may come our way. Give us the courage um, and the strength to seek after your ways all of the days that we have on this earth. Give us humility and wisdom to make good choices this week and that those choices will result in you uh, receiving the glory, and that we will come out uh, being made more better. Be with us uh, this morning as we um, sing songs of praise to you and 
remember the death of our Savior. We know, Father, that we will uh, be edified by our time together this morning and inspired and ready to face the new week. So be with us in our worship to you this morning. We pray that you will feel the glory and praise that we are sending your way. It's through your son that we offer this prayer. Amen. Good morning. Our first song is going to be Here We Are But Straying Pilgrims. And if you're able, please stand with me as we sing. Our next song will be The Church is One Foundation. We'll sing one verse and then transition into O oh, Love That Will Not Let Me Go. Do so.
As part of our worship service, every Sunday we set aside time to partake of the Lord's Supper. We were given this example in Acts 20 and verse 7, where the church in Troas met on the first day of the week to break bread. During this pandemic time, we have, um, the members of this congregation have been bringing their own unleavened bread and fruit of the vine. If you are visiting with us and or a member who uh, needs availability to these emblems because you don't have them, if you would please raise your hand. Hi, there are men in the back who would bring them to you. Is there anyone that needs that? If you are using this and you're new to it, there is a film on top, a top transparent film that you first would open up that gives you access to the, the bread. And then there's a second film that gives you access to the fruit of the vine. The purpose of the Lord's Supper is to remember Christ's death on the cross, to commemorate his death of his body on the cross and the shedding of his blood in his death. Man could not pay this price for, this, for his own sin and the blood of animals was not enough in Hebrews 10 and verse 4. Christ was the only answer. He paid the price for all of us. And he gave himself freely to carry our sins up to the cross. This is not something Jesus initially wanted to go through. After he left the upper room, <clears throat> he went to the Mount of Olives, and he, and he took Peter, James, and John with him and asked them to watch and guard while he went into the garden to pray. In Mark 14 and verse 32, they came to a place named Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here until I have prayed. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to, to be very distressed and troubled. And he said to them, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch. And he went a little beyond them and fell to the ground and began to pray that if it were possible, the hour might pass him by. And he was saying, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came and he found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, Simon, are you sleeping? Could you not watch for one hour? Keep watching and praying that you may not come into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And he went away and repeated this two more times. In Luke 22 and verse 44, it says, and being in agony, he was praying very fervently, and his sweat became like drops of blood falling down upon the ground. He knew the pain and anguish that he would be going through, and he also knew that taking on the sins of the world would separate him from God. So he asked for this cup to be removed from him, but ultimately for God's will to be done. We know God answers prayers in at least one of three ways. He says he answers either yes, no, or keep praying until I give you an answer. Jesus received his answer rather quickly, and he gladly accepted it, knowing it was God's will. This is a gift that we will never be able to repay. Christ gave his life for us that we may have eternal life. This now is an opportunity for us to commute with Christ and also to commute with, with one another in the sharing of the Lord. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 16, Is not the cup a blessing which we bless a sharing of the blood of Christ? Is not the bread which we break a sharing in the body of Christ? Since there is one bread, we know who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. On the night that he was betrayed and arrested, Christ instituted this memorial when he was with his apostles in the upper room the night of the Passover supper. 
Christ, uh, I'm sorry, Paul describes this event in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 23 as it was revealed to him by Christ. Starting in verse 23, For I revealed from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus Christ, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you pro proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats of the bread and drink, or drinks of the cup in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself, if he does not judge the body rightly. In verse 28, Paul tells us to examine ourselves before and while we are particularly partaking the Lord's Supper to make sure that we are in fo focused on the importance of this memorial and what it means to us personally. To make sure we are truly sincere remembering the sacrifice that was made for us on the cross of Calvary. Let us take this opportunity to clear our minds of this world and all the things that are going on so we can reflect back to the death of Christ on that cruel cross. The pain and the suffering he went through during the beatings and the six hours on the cross is more horrific than we can ever imagine. But even worse for him was the separation from God during that time period. Christ made this sacrifice for you and I to free us from the sin that separates us from God. Let us pray for the bread. Kind, gracious, heavenly Father, as we humbly approach your throne in prayer, we thank you for this bread which to us as Christians is Christ's body that was crucified on the cross for the remission of, for, our, for our sins to give us the hope that we have. Help us to clear our minds of these things of this world and to focus on that memorial and what it means to each one of us. And all these things we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Give thanks for the fruit of the vine. Heavenly Father, once again we come before you thanking you for this fruit of the vine, which to us as Christians is Christ's blood that was shed on the cross for the remission of our sins. We continue to pray that we keep our minds focused on these things and reflect back to the cross and the spiritual blessings that we receive. And all these things we ask in Jesus' name, amen.
Take my life, O Father, mold it. Domi. I've been a Christian for about 35 years. And that whole time, I've heard preachers and Christians talk about the five acts of worship. It's not exactly my favorite way for us to describe what we do here in our assemblies, but normally what's intended by that is that when we gather together, we're only going to do what the Scripture authorizes. And so we talk about some of the things that we find in Scripture that churches do when they gather together. They gather together and they pray. They sing, they preach and teach the word, and they read the word of God. They offer the sacrifice of their means by giving in the collection. And of course, we gather around the table of the Lord, remembering Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection through the Lord's Supper, the unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine. And these are things that we find in the New Testament that Christians were supposed to do when they gathered together, and those are the things that we're going to do when we gather together. But what if I were to share with you that there's actually something that we're supposed to do before that? What if I were to explain to you that there is actually a first act of worship 
that we need to be involved in, that we need to pursue. Before we do any of the others, before we sing, before we pray, before we preach, before we participate in the Lord's Supper, before we offer in the collection, there's something that Jesus himself said, this is what you are supposed to do before you do any of that. First, do this. I want to talk about that today, the first act of worship. Before we explain that, though, would you bow with me in prayer? God in heaven, you are magnificent and awesome. You are wonderful and holy. We lift up our praise to you because you are worthy. To us belongs open shame because we are sinners. And yet your son died for us. The propitiation for our sins. And so our sins have been washed away and your anger has been assuaged. And Father, we stand here also as saints. Set apart for your holy service. And as members of your son's kingdom, we pray that you would be with us this morning, that our hearts and minds would be prepared to worship you in holiness, in reverence, that we would lift you up as you have deserved. And Father, help our hearts and minds to be lifted up today by the word that we hear. May we listen to the words of Jesus. May we allow them to sink into our hearts. May we not only hear them, but do them and build our lives upon him, the rock. Father God, help us today. Bring glory and honor to you above all things. We love you so much. Thank you for loving us first. Through your son Jesus, we offer this prayer. Amen. Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, teaches us the first act of worship. Uh, a couple of months ago, we started a class. This was while we were doing just the Zoom classes, and Andrew Roberts was leading us in a class, some of us, through the Sermon on the Mount. And one of the things that I was constantly impressed with and pushed towards and challenged as we were going through that class is, what if I actually lived this every day? I, I mean, as we talked about things, I realized I am really good at talking about all of these passages, guys. I've even written a book about all of those passages, and so I'm good at writing about it. But the more we talked about it, the less I realized, or maybe I should say the more I realized, I'm not very good at living it. And so what if I actually lived what Jesus was teaching in this sermon every day? day. I bring this up because I fear. Here, here's my fear about today's lesson. My fear is that, number one, some of you have probably already figured out what, I'm, what passage I'm going to go to and what I'm going to say. But even if you haven't, when I actually finally get to the passage and say, see, here's what we're supposed to do first, my biggest fear is that we're going to say, oh, well, I've read that passage before. I've heard that before. I mean, that was really a cute, clever way for you to say it, Edwin, but I mean, let's not really get extreme about this. I don't want to get extreme about anything. And I understand that as I look at the Sermon on the Mount, there are places where Jesus uses hyperbole, maybe even in the passage we're using today. I know Jesus does not expect any of us, literally, to chop off our right hands or pluck out our right eyes. I understand that. But at the same time, I am challenged to ask, what if I actually lived this? And how important it is for us to live this? Before we get to the actual passage, I just want us to see what Jesus said in the sermon about how important all the stuff in this sermon actually is. I notice what he says toward the beginning of the sermon. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 19, he says, Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Just before this, Jesus had given his basis for this. He had said, hey, listen, the law and the prophets, I haven't come to destroy them. I've come to fulfill them. He says, until heaven and earth pass away, not one dot or iota of the law is going to pass away until all is accomplished. But what did he say in that? He said that he was coming to accomplish it. He was coming to fulfill it. And then he says, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments, not of those commandments, but of these commandments. Jesus' point is, I came to fulfill those commandments. And because of that, what is he? He's king. And so now he's giving his commandments. He says, whoever relaxes one of the least of these 
commandments will be least in the kingdom of heaven. So here's what we need to understand. When we get to the passage that tells us the act of worship that is supposed to come first, understand that even if that passage is the very least of all the commandments that we find in this sermon, what he says is, is if I relax it, if I loosen it, if I break it, I have become the least in the kingdom of heaven. That sounds pretty important to me. How about to you? But he doesn't stop there because he goes on in the next verse, and here's how he describes this. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And so now I'm plagued. I'm challenged. I'm wondering, wait a minute, what does it mean to be the least in the kingdom of heaven? Does being least in the kingdom of heaven, does it mean, well, I mean, I'm the least, but I'm in there. I'm in there by the hair on my chinny chin chin and the skin of my teeth, just barely, but I'm in there, and so it's going to be okay. Or does being least in the kingdom of heaven mean I look like I'm in there, but I'm actually not, like the scribes and the Pharisees? Which one is it? I'm not 100% sure which one it is. I got to tell you, I don't want to be either one. What Jesus is saying is, don't relax these things. These things that I'm telling you, these things matter. And if you want to be great in my kingdom, he's saying, listen to these and do these. And then we get to the end of the sermon. And it's like Jesus has this crescendo of vignettes, crescendo of little little statements and teachings that are just driving home how important everything he has said in this sermon really is. So we get to Matthew chapter 7 and verses 13 and 14. He says, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. But the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. You know, it's not surprising to me that he says this because the stuff he says in this sermon is hard. There's nothing easy in this sermon. He's giving us the way to life in this sermon, and he says, here's what I know. Here's what I know. Most people are going to hear this, and they're not going to do it. He says, I'm showing you the way. He is, of course, the gate. And it's narrow, and it's difficult, and not many people are going to walk on it. He says, I've given you the teaching of the kingdom, and I know that not many people are going to want to do it. In fact, he moves on to the next vignette, and he says, beware of the false prophets. Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. The false prophets are, of course, in contrast to Jesus. Jesus has given this prophetic teaching, speaking from God. And he says, I know that not many people are going to want to walk this way. In fact, I know that there's going to be a lot of people that teach something else. Beware those false prophets. They're going to look good. They're going to look like sheep. But you need to understand that inwardly they're ravenous wolves. And when you follow what they teach, it's going to be destructive. How am I going to know them, Lord? You'll recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree can't bear good fruit. Excuse me. I got to make sure to read that right. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you'll recognize them by their fruits. And I know what I have a tendency to do when I come to this passage. Oh, I wonder what these fruits are. Oh, I know Paul talked about the fruit of the Spirit. Maybe it's that. And I'm sure that's part of it. And I think about the idea of everyone bearing fruit after their kind. And so if I get out and I teach people the gospel and other folks become Christians, that's bearing fruit. And, and maybe that's part of it. But does it occur to us that the fruit he's talking about is the fruit that he just spent the last three chapters talking about? The people who do what I've said, who bear that fruit, that's the good fruit. And those who don't, and listen to what he says happens there. Those who don't are cut down and thrown into the fire. I don't think I want to be the least in the kingdom. And he keeps going. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord. 
Did we not prophesy in your name? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. He says there's going to be folks on that day of judgment when the kingdom has come in its fullness and he's dividing the sheep from the goats and they're going to say, Lord, my king, and he's going to look at them and say, oh, I don't know you. I don't know you. I mean, you call me Lord, but you haven't done what I said. Here's what I've said. I've given you this, this way, this path. I've, I've taught you the gospel of the kingdom, and here's what it looked like, and here's how important it is, because if you're not doing this, then it doesn't matter how miraculous you think you've been and what wonderful experiences you think you've gone through. If you haven't been doing what I said, you don't know me, and I don't know you. Whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments, depart from me. And then he wraps it all up with a story that most of us are aware of, the story of the two builders. And he says this, everyone then who hears these words of mine, which words, by the way? I mean the ones that he's been preaching. Who hears these words of mine. You know, the commandments that I said don't relax and don't loose. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock and the rains fell and the floods came and the winds blew. And they beat on that house, and it did not fall. Why? Because it had been founded on the rock. But, everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rain came and it fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell. And great was its fall. He says, it's one thing to listen, it's one thing to come, it's one thing to say, hey, you're my king and I love the way you preach. It's another thing to take it home with you and do it. He says, because there's going to be a lot of people that say, hey, Jesus, I love the way you preach. You're my king. You're my God. You're my Lord. But they're going to go home, and they're going to do something else. And when the rains fall and the floods come, their house is going to fall. And I have no doubt that included in this teaching is the storms of life, as I have often said in the past, the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune that come against us all. But as we were going through this class a few months ago, Wendy Boffman brought up, and I think she's probably right, that there's probably something more to this. Because, you know, there's another time in the Bible where we hear about the floods of judgment, right? When the rains fell and the floods came. Do you all remember that story? What story am I talking about there? That's with Noah. The time when the rains fell and the floods came and the winds blew against the houses and every house but one was conquered and crushed. And the only house that survived was Noah. Because he found favor in the eyes of the Lord, and he did what the Lord said. Brothers and sisters, friends and neighbors, Jesus isn't just saying, hey, your life will go better if you do what I say. He's saying if you want to survive the judgment, like Noah did, do what I say. Guys, that's how important what I'm about to share with you is. Here's what he says. First act of worship. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 21. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 21, Jesus says, You have heard that it was said, You shall not murder. And everyone who murders will be liable to the judgment. Got that one down, Lord. Not going to murder. Hadn't killed anybody this week. I'm good. Because I have heard that it was said, you shall not murder. And everyone who murders is liable to the judgment. So, 
I think I'm going to be okay when the rains fall and the floods rise. Hadn't killed anybody. And Jesus says, but I am saying to you. And the reason he can say this to us is because he is the king. It's his kingdom. He's saying, but I, me, the king, the king of this kingdom of heaven, this kingdom that you want to be in, I know you have heard, you shall not murder, and whoever murders is liable to the judgment. But I, the one you're calling Lord and king, I say to you, whoever is angry with his brother shall be liable to the judgment. And whoever insults his brother shall be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, shall be liable to the hell of fire. Now, I know some of you are reading from translations that include another statement in there. Whoever is angry with his brother without cause. Scholars and students of Scripture have found more manuscripts and better manuscripts that have led them to believe that actually the inclusion of that phrase without cause is actually a relaxing of Jesus' teaching. That Jesus likely didn't say without cause. And the problem with the phrase without cause and including without cause in it, let me ask you, you ever been angry without a cause? I mean, every time you were angry, there was a cause, wasn't there? I know every time I've ever been angry, there was a cause. Every time. And so I say, hot dog, this doesn't matter to me because every time I've ever been angry, I had a reason. And the the thing that we need to understand, I mean, I'm not saying that there's never any reason to be angry. angry. Anger is not necessarily a bad emotion. God gets angry. The problem is, is that we finite humans are the absolute worst at judging when the right time to be angry is. And so, James will say to us, and James, the brother of Jesus, who often refers back to this sermon, the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. And so we sit back and we say, well, God gets angry, so I'm allowed to be angry. But God is also the one who said, you know what, guys, let me do the vengeance taking. Let me be the one who acts in anger. You guys don't do that because you guys aren't any good at it. Your anger doesn't produce my righteousness, God says. God's anger produces his righteousness, but we're really bad at it. And so, even if Jesus did say without cause, even if that really is supposed to be there, please understand that the only causes for anger that would be justified are the, the things that would cause God to also get angry. And so Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 26, be angry and do not sin. Even if I have a justifiable reason to be angry, even if this is something that God himself would really be angry about, I'm not allowed to sin while I'm angry, and I'm not supposed to let the sun go down on my anger. I'm supposed to deal with this quickly. And so later in the passage, he tells me some things I'm not supposed to do while I'm angry. And, 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 and here's what I am supposed to do when I get angry. He says, let all bitterness, this is Ephesians 4.31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. So guys, look, even if I can say I have a really legitimate justified cause for being angry right now, what am I supposed to do in dealing with that? I'm supposed to get rid of bitterness and wrath and anger. I'm supposed to deal with it properly. I'm not supposed to act from that. I'm supposed to get rid of clamor and slander. And I'm definitely supposed to put away all malice. I'm not allowed to do these things. I'm not allowed to act towards others in this anger. Because when I do, then I'm liable to the judgment. And so, Jesus goes on to say in Matthew chapter 5, he says in verses 21 through 22, you've heard that it was said, you shall not murder. If you murder, you're liable to the judgment. But I'm telling you, if you get angry, if you insult people, if you call them names, you're liable to the judgment. So, now guys, this is how important this is. If... You are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you. Leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, 
be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. So guys, I want you to imagine the picture here. The the Jewish family has traveled from home. They've brought their sacrifice with them. They've finally made it into the temple. They've stood in line for who knows how long to finally get up to the altar. And the priests are now working with them. And the father is pulling out the knife and he's sharpening and he's about ready to offer this sacrifice. And then he remembers, oh, wait a minute. Oh, no. I got in a fight with Jebediah last week. And I called him some names. And I yelled at him. And I kicked his lamb. Priest, could you hold on a minute? I've got to go take care of something first. Can you imagine that? And so here's what he says to us. He says to us, if you're about to give your offering at the altar, first, go be reconciled. Not first, pray. Not first, sing. Not first, hear the sermon or preach the sermon. Not first, take the Lord's Supper. Not first, offer your collection. First, go be reconciled. I mean, maybe that's how we should start our assemblies. Okay, guys, hey. Anybody yell at your spouses this morning while you were getting ready? Be reconciled. Anybody call your kids a name this morning because they wouldn't get out of bed? After you had talked to them three times? So you only get that specificity in a sermon when the preachers actually lived it. You know what you need to do? You need to go first. Be reconciled. Is there that brother or sister on the other side of the auditorium that you haven't talked to in five years because you got mad at them and now you've been giving them the shoulder and holding them at arm's length? First, go be reconciled. And then he says this, to express to us how important this is. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to the court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. Over the years as I've studied this passage, uh, there's been a thing that's caused me to struggle with it. And that is, is that he says to me, he says, hey, if you're angry with your brother, You're liable to the judgment. And then he says, so if you're at the altar giving your gift and you remember your brother or sister has something against you, that which sounds a whole lot, if you're at the altar and you remember that your brother or sister is angry at you, go be reconciled. And I've I've, I've really struggled with why the shift? Why is there the shift from I'm angry and now it's talking about they're being angry at me? And then I got to this part and I realized what's going on. I mean, it's possible that what he's saying is this anger thing is such a big deal that if you remember someone's angry at you, you, you go help them take care of it. That's possible. But I think, it's, I think it's actually something different. Do you remember how this teaching all started? It all started with, you've heard if you commit murder, you're liable to the judgment. I'm telling you, if you're angry at your brother, you're liable to the judgment. If you have insulted him, if you've called him names, if you have acted out your anger towards your brother or your sister, you are liable to the judgment. And so, if you're out there worshiping, you better go reconcile with them first. And let me tell you why. The reason you should go first is because you are on your way to the court. And when your accuser comes before the judge and talks about what you did in your anger, Jesus is not saying, hey, I mean, be careful because the judge might side with your accuser. So it'd probably be in your best interest to go ahead and resolve this thing. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is when you come before the judge, he will side with your accuser. So you better take care of this quick. Because if you end up before the judge, before you take care of this, your accuser is going to hand you to the judge, the judge is going to hand you to the guard, and the guard is going to throw you into prison, and you will not get out of there until you have paid that debt off completely. And guys, it is hard to pay off a debt when you're in prison.
And so this is the problem. You know, the problem is, it goes back to that without cause thing. I am convinced that every time I've ever been angry, I had good reason to be angry. And and I treat anger as if the anger itself justifies the sin I committed while I was angry. It's like Bruce Banner and the Hulk. I like to think that I am normally, deep down at heart, I'm normally Bruce Banner. I'm mild-mannered. I'm meek. I just want to help people. I want to be nice to people. But listen, if you make me angry, you won't like me when I'm angry because I can't control myself when I'm angry, and I'm not to be held responsible for what I do when I'm angry. Anger is this like exceptional circumstance that means that everything I did while I was angry, well, that wasn't my fault. That's not who I really am. And so I justify bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander and malice because, I mean, guys, I was just angry. We're all human, right? You ever been angry? It's hard to not sin when you're angry. So I can't be held liable for that. And yet, Jesus says that's exactly what's going to happen. Because here's the deal. Anger is not this exceptional circumstance that causes me to behave in a way that is completely different from me. What anger is, is that moment when all the filters and the guards are down. When what's really deep down inside is what's bubbling up because normally what I hold in because I control myself and I know how nice people are supposed to act, all those things that I keep in control, when anger flares up and that whatever happens comes out, what Jesus is pointing out is that's what's actually in there. That's what's actually in there. You're not the person who is always controlled and stayed and gentle. You're the person you are when the emotions rip away the filters in your heart. And so, yeah, you are liable to the judgment for being that person, for having that heart. So first, be reconciled. First, be reconciled. Guys, this is the first act of worship. Maybe, as I said earlier, we should have some moments where we we take some time. Hey, do you need to reconcile with anybody? Make that phone call. Walk over to them. Maybe we should do that. You know, I will say this. We who are the people who say that the pattern of sound words matters ought to take this more seriously than anybody else. Because guys, we're the people that say when you come here and you worship God, you should only do it his way. And I believe that. I believe we should only do here what God has authorized. We shouldn't add to it. We shouldn't take away from it. I believe that. And I believe that souls are going to be lost from some who don't do it that way. I I believe that. But in a moment of honesty, here's something I have to admit. I do not have a Bible passage that says, if you add instruments to your singing, the accuser will hand you to the judge and the judge to the guard and he will cast you into prison and you won't get out of there until you've paid it off. I don't have a verse that says that. Guys, I don't have a verse that says if you take the Lord's Supper on Saturday night or you don't take it on Sunday or you take hamburger and Coke instead of unleavened bread and fruit of the vine, be careful because the accuser will hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you'll be cast into prison and you won't get out of there until you've paid it off. I don't have those verses. But guys, I do have this verse. And this verse says, if you have been angry with your brother or sister, and you don't reconcile that, 
the accuser will hand you to the judge and the judge will hand you to the guard and the guard will cast you into prison and you will not get out of there. And so if all those other things matter as much as we think they do, brothers and sisters, how much more does this one matter? If authority and a pattern matters to us as much as we claim, what about this pattern? And please understand one final thing. The first act of worship is not restoring your brother or sister. There is a time to restore your brother or sister. If you're saying, I had a really legitimate reason to be angry, they sinned, there's a time to deal with that. What we're dealing with right now is the fact that instead of dealing with that properly when it happened the first time, I got angry and I did something I wasn't supposed to do. And my first act is to go deal with that. What I did, cleaning up my side of the street. And so we come to something else Jesus says in the sermon in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 3. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that's in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye, when there's this log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. The word first is only used three times in the sermon. One of them is when Jesus says, seek first. First, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So I I would think that when we see these other two firsts, they must be a part of seeking God's kingdom and righteousness. And the other two firsts are, when you are worshiping and you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, first, be reconciled. And the other one is, don't try to take the speck out of your brother or sister's eye. First, remove the log from your own eye. Look, guys, there will be a time to restore your brother and sister, but right now what we're dealing with is that if, if, if I behaved in anger and I justified wrath and bitterness and anger and slander and clamor and malice, I will tell you, I really like the fact that most English translations translate that one word clamor because I never clamor. I've never clamored a day in my life. Now, if they translated it yell then I'd be in trouble because I do that all the time. And that's what clamoring is, guys. It's making loud, useless noises. And don't think that your yelling is useful because remember, the anger of man doesn't produce the righteousness of God. So first, that's what I've got to deal with. Once I get the log of anger out of my eye, maybe there will be a point at which I am qualified to restore them. But first, get the log out of your own eye. First, be reconciled. The first act of worship. How are you doing at that? If you'd like to, you can put your notes and Bibles away at this point. In just a moment, we're going to sing a song of invitation and encouragement. So a few months ago, we're studying through the Sermon on the Mount over the computer, and I'm, I'm just challenged right and left. What if you actually lived this sermon every day? And it hit me. Well, if I'm going to live this sermon today, I have a lot of reconciling to do. If I were going to live this sermon every day, when you yell, I wouldn't clamor. I wouldn't wish ill on people. I wouldn't call people names when they pull out in front of me. I wouldn't yell at my wife. 
just because we disagree about something. I wouldn't get mad and push people away just because they disagreed with me. And I realized, man, I've got a lot of this. And so I started praying that God would start revealing to me in whatever way he would. Who have I done that to? Because it's been a lot of people. And I will tell you, unless you actually want to start remembering things, don't ever pray that prayer because all of a sudden I did start remembering some things. I'm not saying it was miraculous. I'm just saying I started remembering. And I, oh, I don't want to talk to that person. I'm, I'm mad at the, oh yeah. And so I guess the reason why I'm explaining all of this to you guys right now is that I, I've realized that there's probably a whole lot of people that I've done that to and I don't even remember who all they are. And so if you're one of those people, please come talk to me because what I want to do is reconcile. And I may not remember you yet. In fact, I may not ever. In fact, that leads me to the final point that I want to make here and that is is that as I walk through that, all of a sudden I realize is that if my way to heaven is finding every person I've ever wronged when I was angry and making sure to reconcile and fix that, I ain't ever gonna make it. It's been too much, it's been too deep, it's been too much a part of who I have been. And what I need, because I will never be able to pay off that cost, what I need is someone who will pay it for me. Guys, what if that had been the judgment trumpet? Where would you have been right then? I'll tell you what. If you didn't have Jesus paying for all these things, I can tell you where you'd have been. Your accuser would hand you to the judge, the judge would hand you to the guard and you'd be cast into prison and you would not get out of there. But Jesus has paid the price. He is the offering. That is not permission to just live in anger because Jesus has paid for it. He's, that's not how we live in his kingdom. But it is the joy that says, I don't have to sit here in utter fear and terror because I know I violated it. I can work on reconciling and I can live in the knowledge that Jesus has paid the price. Have you submitted to Jesus' sacrifice? Have you given your life over to him so that he can pay the price? We'd love to help you with that this morning. Jesus said, he that believes and is baptized will be saved. Peter said, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. We want to help you with that. If we can help you, won't you please come forward right now as we stand and sing?